Tonight, it is all about the law. Our legal panel joining us to weigh in on the Menendez corruption trial. We'll have the latest from Newark. Jury still deadlocked. How telling is that? And could we be looking at a hung jury? Then, families of Sandy Hook victims, they are suing Remington that for selling and marketing the weapon that killed those 20 kids and six adults. Will they succeed and overcome the immunity that only gun makers enjoy in this country? And also, an assistant district attorney in Dallas has just been canned. That after abusive treatment on an Uber driver is call caught on video that you'll see shortly. The question is, when someone is a public servant, where is the line that gets them fired for public behavior? Good evening, everyone, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. We begin tonight at the federal courthouse in Newark, where the jury in the Menendez corruption trial is deadlocked again. The judge sent them home for the day again, and they'll head back to the jury room first thing tomorrow morning. Dominic Carter, as he has been since the gavel first dropped in this trial, he joins us now with the latest. And good evening to you, Richard. We will be right back here again tomorrow morning. Federal Judge William Walls meant when he told the jury to take its time. All he said to the panel... Have a good evening and see you tomorrow. I appreciate that there are clearly jurors who are asserting uh, my innocence as well in the jury room. Defense attorneys filed a brief for the judge to instruct the jury that a deadlock can be an acceptable outcome to the case. On the other side, prosecutors want deliberations to continue. Do you think Senator Jury knows it's an acceptable outcome for them to have a hung jury? Well, I, I certainly hope they know that. The jury has a right at any time to uh, communicate with the judge as to questions or as to the status of their deliberations. And as they did a few days ago, if that's the status of their deliberations and that's what they want to communicate, I would believe that they know that they have that right. Courtroom sketch artist Christine Cornell has been at cases going back to 1975. But to your memory, in terms of cases you've worked on, what's the longest you've seen a deadlock jury be told to go back and reconsider? Probably a week. Once they're deadlocked? I mean, I've certainly seen it go back and last several more days. Um, I'm trying to think about the Aiden Pates case because I think that thing went on. I mean, it seems to me that the jury was out for a month. And I know that's totally wacky. I think it actually was, and it was held up by one juror in particular who just says, I can't uh, convict this man. So as of tonight, Richard, there are no signs that Judge Walls is ready to pull the plug and declare a mistrial. Deliberations get back underway tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m. And we, of course, will be here. Reporting from the federal courthouse in Newark, I'm Dominic Carter. Richard, let's go back to you in the studio. All right, Dominic, now let's bring in our legal panel. Nicholas Allard, he's a dean of the Brooklyn Law School. To his left, Doug Von Oyce, founding partner of Carson Von Oyce, also focusing on corporate misconduct. And as you know, if you watch the show, one of the legal 500 most influential trial lawyers in the country, Mayo Bartlett, attorney at the law offices of Mayo Bartlett PLC and a former chief of the Bias Crimes Unit at the Westchester County DA's office. Okay, um, we've talked ad nauseum about what, is really the issue with this case, the definition of corruption nowadays, stream of benefits, all the other things. What I want to focus more on now is tactics. And Dominic got an exclusive interview, the first, with juror number eight, which threw this thing into a frenzy. And I'll play that bite in a second. But Nick, I start with you. The strategy, you're the defense right now. And we'll play the clip here. But you have a juror who says that she felt pressured. Uh, she didn't like what the, the foreman was doing. Many people like her felt the same way in the, in the deliberations room. That there was at least four to her number or five people here on the jury that wanted to uh, uh, acquit or at least, you know, uh, she's looking at a hung jury. If you're the defense, do you already start motions um, to get this case thrown out? Or do you say, hey, I got a chance for an acquittal here? Let's let this thing play out. Why, why rush here with any appeals or anything else? Because you don't know how it's going to turn out. Well, my friend Abby Lowell is going to make the right decision. He's uh, had quite a run with uh, John Edwards, and uh, he's handling Kushner's investigation. So in between, he's uh, working on this case. Uh, he'll figure out the right thing. His, you know, the two basic strategies during the trial is to punch holes in the uh, prosecution case or write your own narrative and that's what they've done here. They, 
The narrative basically is that this is, you know, standard political service, constituency service, and uh, given the recent cases, it's hard uh, to get a, harder and harder to get a conviction when that argument is made. Uh, at this point, I think they're just going to wait. He's really sitting in the catbird seat right now, and maybe my colleagues will disagree, but I think that he'll just wait and see how it plays out. Well, let me remind everybody, guys, um, when we say juror number eight. So it was scheduled, and I still don't know why the judge allowed this, but this was a pre-existing vacation that the juror had said that she had planned to take. Obviously, the judge nor anyone involved thought the trial would have gone as long as it did, but nonetheless it did, and she took her scheduled vacation. As soon as she walks out, and another juror was going to be in panel, they begin the deliberations all over again, starting this Monday. This was the end of last week. She decided to walk across the street, off of the court grounds, look for our Dominic Carter, and unload as to all the problems that she found with both the prosecution's case and then also um, why she believed that there was not, the burden was not met to convict uh, Mr. Menendez on any of the counts and then talked about the process in the jury room. Here's a quick reprisal. She spoke to him both on the day uh, she got out and the following day in a sit-down interview. Here's the day after. What was going on in that jury room? I said, I said, on all charges, he's not guilty. And then I started going around all the charges and letting them know how I felt. And they said, oh, so you're not going to change your mind. And I said, no, I'm not going to change my mind. They, to me, they were holding on because they knew that Thursday was my last day and that maybe once Evelyn leaves, maybe they can change everybody else's mind. See, that's how I felt. You have said to the remaining jurors, do the right thing. What does that mean? What that means is to make sure that when we were talking about doubt and you're not sure and you doubt, then I don't think you should say lock him up. You'd say he's guilty. Because if you're not sure, you should always say no. You told us yesterday you believe a hung jury. Do you still feel that way? Yes, I still feel that way. Why? Because there were definitely at least four that were sticking to not guilty. There were four definitely saying not guilty. I don't think they're going to change their mind. They felt the same. They felt just like me. They were standing their ground. Okay. So, Ms. Bartlett, um, first off, explain to me how, uh, listen, God bless Dominic, got the interview, right? Amazing. The following day, that day that the interview ran, the judge said to the jury, now I know you've seen another juror on TV referencing the interview and also some of you may have seen this. Why are we letting jurors talk? Uh, believe me, God bless you, Dominic, but why are they letting them talk at all in an ongoing case? Well, there's a bigger problem. The bigger problem is that in any case, uh, judges are supposed to and routinely do caution juries and members of juries that they're not supposed to read or hear anything about it. If their friends or family know anything about the case, they're not supposed to share it. <laughs> Let so alone the fact introducing that, yourself to your court. Bro. But the fact that the judge made that statement is very telling about our criminal justice system as a whole because the reality is that I don't think that very many people actually take that oath very seriously so they absolutely see what's happening on the case. There's no way they don't read any newspaper, they don't watch any television, and as soon as it comes on, they run away. So at the end of the day, he should have never had to tell them that. But secondly, uh, look, you have this young lady who was a member of the jury. She's out here giving us a snapshot of what it means to be a juror. And I think she hit it 100% on the head. You know, you're, you're presumed innocent until proven guilty. The defense has zero burden whatsoever. And if you're not sure, basically, that the person did it, you should acquit. It's not, well, I kind of think he or she did okay, something. Okay, but to that point, Doug, you're a former prosecutor, right? All of a sudden, you hear there's four or five in the room um, that feel r reportedly the same way um, that Ms. Arroyo did. Are you going now at this point and talking about working out a different plea, lesser charges here? Uh, are you rolling the dice that hopefully this thing turns out? What's going on behind the scenes? Pull the curtain back for us, given that they get an insight, if you believe the woman, as to what's going on in the deliberation room. Well, I don't know. This particular case, I don't know if a plea is possible. I mean, if he pleads guilty to anything, he has a problem. So, but generally, if you know, listen, if you try cases, you know that juries fight. I mean, if you can listen, you can sit in the courtroom sometimes and listen to the jury room and you'll hear jurors yelling and screaming at each other. I mean, that happens all the time. These, these deliberations are very contentious. But 
At this point, you know that days have gone by where the jury has indicated they're deadlocked. After days go, when days go by, it's very unlikely that a juror is going to say, you know what, I was committed to this point, and uh, for days and days, I'm changing my vote. I know there's always exceptions here, but if you're into the third day, when the judge keeps sending them back here, it's pretty much a big tell here that there's not only discord in there, but they're probably not going to reach you an unanimous verdict, right? Yeah, and there is a charge that a uh, judge usually gives a jury when they say they're deadlocked. It's a charge that basically says you've got to do everything you can to get this done because resources have been spent. And I'm sure he's probably given them that charge already. I can't see how this is going to be anything other than a deadlock yeah, jury. It's, it's, it's called an Allen charge, and when you give that Allen charge, generally, in my opinion at least, it heavily favors the prosecution. And what you're doing is you're wearing jury down. So you have people who want to get on with their lives, and at some point, those who are holdouts are less likely to be holdouts one way or the other. And in a case where it's more people that are leaning toward conviction of something, uh, you'll well, probably see them though, put Nick, pressure that on That makes it ripe for appeal. First of all, you hear from at least one juror. I don't know what's admissible or not here. I'm not the attorney playing one on TV, but I I'm saying if you've heard what juror number eight uh, said that we played a portion thereof, and they've already been there for three days, I would assume that even if a conviction were to come back, which looks unlikely at this point, there certainly is grounds for appeal, right? Well, we're a long way between getting a result here and an appeal. Um, in terms of the result, uh, the longer this goes, I mean, my gut tells me that uh, the tougher it is to avoid a deadlock jury. Uh, but then, you know, you already have these issues that are surrounding um, the behavior of juror number eight and what the judge did or didn't do in that circumstance. And then overall, this is in a context where appellate court after appellate court, including the Supreme Court of the United States yep. in the Virginia governor's the case, case yep. you know, has made it increasingly harder uh, to get for the for the government to get corruption uh, convictions in cases where tawdry behavior, which people in the street may believe uh, is wrong and corrupt, uh, is viewed by the courts as not clearly uh, criminal enough under existing law. And to that point, we've talked at length on this program after both the Skelos and the Silver trial in New York, McDonald obviously in Virginia, and now it's we're seeing in New Jersey with Menendez. Supreme Court's going to have to take this up again because I, I swear to God, I've talked to 20 attorneys and I'm getting 20 different definitions of what corruption is, even with different charges to the jury here that try to avoid that same question. It's still ephemeral. What is corruption? I think I know it. I think when I see it, I can tell you what an abuse of power is, but what stream of benefits are or not, uh, you know, it, there's so much conjecture still left out and I think that's exhibited in the jury room. Well, I would, I would qualify that just a little bit. The Supreme Court in the McDonald case was eight was a unanimous uh, under Justice Roberts. And so really, if the public doesn't like this, the public is going to need, they have a role to play too, and it's for the legislatures to clarify and tighten up uh, some of the rules where the but ambiguity the, is. But wasn't the McDonald case, and I've got to go a break, but wasn't that really more condemning the instructions that were given to the jury rather than clarifying exactly what's defined as corruption from stream of benefits and what the quid pro quo is? I mean, isn't that still a little undefined at this point? The point was they just said in those cases they didn't charge the jury the right way, and obviously that polluted what happened in New York with Skeleton Silver, but they never got down to the root of it is, when you're an elected official, what you can and you can't do with your office. Well, six of one, $175,000 uh, <laughs> of another, and basically what Roberts' opinion said was that uh, the conduct um, is outside the scope of what should be the narrow focus of a criminal act. It was just regular, you know, we, we may not like it, but it's regular political activity. And so that was their interpretation of the law. And, and to me, that's still the ongoing debate for another day, which is what is regular political activity and, and acceptable or not um but, you draw uh, the line. yes and we hopefully will have a verdict this week as they resume deliberations tomorrow once again in newark all right coming up next though we go over to connecticut where sandy hook parents are suing the maker of the semi-automatic weapon used to kill first graders in newtown but remington and other gun makers they have immunity from these suits the question is will this case pierce set immunity